Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this, which is our second in the series around controlled environment agriculture. And today's session is Urban Agritech on your doorstep. So my name is Wendy Hewitson and I am the Eagle Labs Programme Manager for our Agritech programme. So before we begin, I do have a mandatory disclaimer I need to read out to you. And then we'll get on to the exciting things where I can talk about our Eagle Labs Agritech programme, around the Eagle Lab farm, around CEA, and then introduce our speakers. So today we have asked Laura Vickers from Harper Adams University and Paul Myers from Farm Urban to join us today to provide us with some tips and tricks on understanding what is urban agritech and the role it plays within our communities. So the topics discussed are an overview of options for you to think about and to help you with your independent research and business decisions. They are not intended as recommendations or advice. Please also remember that your business has its own individual circumstances, so the statements and views expressed may not be suitable for your business. So as I mentioned, my name is Wendy Hewitson and I am the Agritech Programme Lead for Eagle Labs. And we have a math community now of Eagle Lab incubators. So Barclays operates the UK's large network of business incubators across Eagle Labs and our international fintech experts rise. We have a combined community of over 650 technology startups who are actually globally across 29 locations. So we bring together a community of startups, a global community of the world's top innovators, industries, mentors, and we try to create an interconnected ecosystem to accelerate startups, transform corporates, and empower those future skills that are needed to sustain our ecosystems. So when you think of Eagle Labs, as I said, we have 26 locations across the UK and they are from down in the south within the Channel Islands of Guernsey and Jersey, right the way up to Aberdeen in the north of Scotland. As I mentioned, we have over 650 tech startups and scale-ups within that network and we have done over 3,250 events last year with circa 120,000 attendees, which is pretty, pretty amazing. However, as I said, we have a specialism in our ecosystem for Agritech. And we were really, really proud to announce that in October 2020, we opened the very first incubator dedicated to Agritech. And that's our Eagle Lab Farm with our partnership with the University of Lincoln where we are hoping to ensure that this ecosystem within agriculture all the way from farm to fork is supported by the technology that we can provide from Lincoln University and also those expressive programs and mentorship that we offer within Eagle Labs. So our view is to accelerate the UK's agricultural industry adoption of emerging technologies and increase those efficiencies across the food supply chain, as I said, from field to fork. From growing more food with less resources to the use of things like robotics for planting and picking, and also demonstrating how AI can improve resilience, we are trying to empower the industry to make better decisions on how they work their businesses for now and in the future. So Agritech Eagle Labs are tailored specifically to support the Agritech agri-food businesses with our Eagle Lab network. So Agritech is purely the use of technology and technological improvements and innovations to improve the efficiencies and outputs within agriculture. It's the application of technology to improve all those elements of the farming and growing process. Some of those are widely commonly used, such as IoT, such as sensors and drones, such as precision farming, and then we look at things also like soil health and optimization and alternative proteins. And then what you hear about today is obviously controlled environment agriculture and vertical farming. So why are we doing this? Why are we looking at this? Why is it so important? If you think about where we are today, it's estimated we have approximately 7.7 .7 billion people on our planet. And that's expected to increase by a further 2 billion 
10.7 billion by the year 2050. And again, we should need or require an additional maybe 60 to 70 percent extra food to feed those miles. So again, thinking about all of the agri-tech out there, agriculture and what we need to do, the environmental implications of these challenges are real. And the water waste in food that is never eaten or consumed is equal to the water needs of Africa. And the CO2 emissions are equivalent to removing every car off the roads across the world. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, roughly one third of the food produced in the world for human consumption every year, now that's approximately 1.5 billion tonnes, should we say gets lost or is wasted. So the food industry does face enormous systemic challenges. And as we're aware, further expansion of agriculture is not a viable solution to meet its future needs because we're using nearly all of that land that is suitable for agriculture already. So as I said, we're here to talk about CEA or Controlled Environment Agriculture and to more personally around urban agritech. But CEA is a technology-based approach towards food production. And the goal of CEA is to circumvent and minimize factors such as seasonal or like today unpredictable weather, to encourage environmentally friendly food that are production systems that run a high year round high quality crop production. And it's traceable throughout the whole of the production chain. Plants are often grown using hydroponic methods in order to supply the proper amounts of water and nutrients to that root zone. CEA optimizes the use of these resources, such as the water, energy, space, capital, and labor. Vertical farming has the ability to produce crops all year round, as I said, in a controlled environment, with the possibility of increased yields by adjusting the amount of carbon and nutrients that those plants receive. So in consideration to urban agriculture, Controlled environment agriculture can exist inside buildings that already exist or such as repurposed abandoned buildings. Urban agriculture areas contain more than half of the world's population and contribute approximately 70% of the plant's energy emissions. So that's really something just to start thinking about now while we go into our presentations. And we're really, really privileged today to have some of those experts with us. They can tell you more about the research and, be, and development being done in this fascinating year. And you can also hear some of the new businesses and business models that are emerging into the marketplace. So as I said, this is our second session, Urban Agritech, on your doorstep. And my first speaker is Laura Vickers from Harper Adams University, whose presentation is Urban Agritech and Communities. So we'll speak to Laura first, and then we'll bring in Paul Myers, from Farm Urban to talk around his journey so far. And I think this will really bring some food for thought, if you'll pardon the pun. So Laura, let's welcome Laura Mapp Vickers from Harper Adams. Hi, Laura. Hi, Wendy. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Good, good, good. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. So I think I've talked for long enough. So let's hear it yourself talking around urban agri-tech and communities. Thank you very much. Um, so just to say first and foremost, thank you very much to the Eagle Labs for inviting me today um, to give this presentation. Um, what I'm going to do with this presentation is I really wanted to touch on um, what you mentioned in your introduction, Wendy, which is the role of communities in urban agri-tech. Um, so taking us on a journey around the world, covering different um, approaches, to the integration of urban agriculture and also then the use of technology. Um, and the, the word technology means different things to different people. So what for us would be a technological innovation, um, actually some of our technology that's currently in practice might actually be technology if we were to go somewhere else. Um, so just to sort of give a little bit of an outline of the thing I'm just gonna cover in the next 10 minutes um, is a little bit about the different types of models, so community-based versus community-supported urban agriculture. Um, and then I'm going to just focus a little bit on what we already know, the benefits of urban farming and having urban agritech um, in our cities is actually proving for communities, and that's for around the world. Um, so in there, there might be some innovative models 
that I mention about the people are doing. And then I finally want to touch on just a couple of examples of how technology has been integrated with urban agriculture within communities and very much emphasizing on everything that I give as an example that there is this community engagement going on. So we can have community-based urban agriculture and what we mean by this is that the the urban agriculture or the adoption of urban agritech has really been with a focus of trying to build community cohesion and bring communities together so this may mean that that act's actually been community driven or that it is very much uh, having community involvement so active engagement by uh, lots of different players from the community itself an alternative model uh, that may interest people is community supported urban agriculture. This is where we're trying to bring a really close connection then between the consumer and then the producer, so the urban farmer. Um, and one model of this uh, exists in the States, so it's called Troy Gardens. And in Troy Gardens, what happened is the community came together to buy some land, but then they set up some other trusts. And one of the things that they set up was the Friends of Troy Gardens. Um, and what they have is they have then a fully functioning uh, urban farm, but that the people from the community actually buy shares into. Now, when they buy a share, what they actually get from their share for that uh, year is then a, a supply of seasonal produce and from the farm. Um, other sort of investment is that then the community are encouraged then to, to work and invest in the farm, and then they can get reduced shares, which is then a reduced amount um, of produce then throughout the year. So there's different models when we're thinking about how we can engage our community in urban agriculture and with urban agriculture and production, then the urban agri-tech. So what I want to sort of cover is what do we know about the benefits um, of urban agriculture then? Um, well, I've started off with this first bullet point saying community gardening, and I think gardening's not, not agri-tech, um, but just bear with me for a moment. What we've already seen is that when we bring people together in a cultivation environment, um, that within that cultivation environment, we can really bring uh, and help people feel more connected, particularly vulnerable groups. So by vulnerable groups, we're thinking about the elderly. We might be thinking of equalizing the, the, the balance then uh, and having more women involved. Uh, we may be thinking of um, ethnic uh, or minority groups within the community. So really helping then to tackle things like the sense of isolation by building instead of a, a sense of place and civic pride. So we've seen this already with things like allotments. And I really think that this is a a benefit that things like vertical farms and urban agri-tech can also have in bringing them together in this cultivating environment. And really when we think about cultivating, whether that is plants or whether it's even keeping livestock, we've seen examples in the UK um, of one that's called hen power, which is where they bring the elderly into, into poultry keeping, poultry keeping within city environments. It doesn't just have to be fruit and vegetables. Um, but when we do see this, what we see is that through cultivation and growing something and nurturing something, it really is a social and cultural leveler. Um, so it doesn't really matter how old you are or what background you have, the cultivation and, and the enjoyment in activity is going to be the same. Um, the other interesting thing that we've seen, and again, I'm going to go across the seas here, I'm going to go to Canada, Toronto, I'm also going to go to Los Angeles in the United States, is that we've seen that we can build up what's called cultural capital within our cities using urban agritech. And I think this is particularly important for vertical farming. Uh, so what do I mean by this? I mean that you have areas through normal sort of retailers, they will go with what the majority of people maybe want to purchase. Um, but there are these smaller niche um, niche lines then into the market, uh, particularly for herbs and spices that may be of particular importance to certain cultural groups. So what we've seen in Toronto and what we've seen in Los Angeles is that urban agriculture has been used as a vehicle um, for minority groups to be able to cultivate herbs and spices that have a, a, a great deal of cultural importance to them. So we're building then the cultural capital through the urban agritech. And also urban agritech, a lot of the technologies, when we think of urban, they actually are utilized in rural as well. So I think we've built this connectivity as well with this exchange of knowledge and exchanging of technologies. So I just want to highlight an example of a scheme that's run in Europe because this highlights a really important extra benefit that the integration of urban agritech and urban agriculture generally can give to communities and citizens. Um, so this is going to depend on where we're looking at and where we're looking at in terms of politically and geography. 
So this slide is really just giving a couple of pictures and some information about Horizon 2020 funded project, the Interreg Agrigo for Cities project. Now we have to consider the area that this is taking place in. Um, so the area that this takes place in um, is really focused on six pilot cities in Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Montenegro, Romania and Slovenia. Now in this region there is a very complicated past political history of, through the last 20th century and the 21st century. Um, so what this project is setting out to help is that very much the citizens have got disconnected with public institutions and with public governing bodies. They don't feel really like they have uh, a voice. So through urban agriculture, what they're trying to do in the region is to improve the connection then with, between citizens and public bodies um, by getting citizens to participate more through active participation um, and get more involved in decision making. So we're seeing that urban agriculture and urban agritech provide real opportunities then to really connect then citizens with governance and public authorities. So I think this is quite an interesting benefit that could come from the adoption of urban agritech. Also wanting to move to the other side of the world, and this is where I come back to the point I made, that technology may seem different to different people. So in Malaysia, for them, technology is the utilisation of very basic hydroponic systems, such as deep water culture, um, particularly with these projects. Um, so in Kuala Lumpur, they have a social housing uh, development, and this is very much designed to help the very impoverished uh, in the community um, alleviate themselves out of poverty. So they move them into social housing. They, If they live there for a certain amount of time, they can buy that housing at a discounted rate. Normally where this social housing is located, it's not necessarily on prime land. Um, so it might be, say, next to a railway development, which means that there is some disused, unused land nearby these social housing developments. So what the Raya Permia People's Housing Project has done, along with the Dignity Kitchen, um, and a few other organisations, if they're set out to use this disused land and to do things like basic aquaculture uh, to produce fish, basic hydroponics, and also to create uh, garden style environments. Now, what this does is that this engages the community into growing. Uh, some of the things that they grow are medicinal plants that the community can use, but also herbs and spices that they can use to put into soaps, unique teas and chocolates that they can set, then sell. And by doing that, what they're doing is they're creating a little formal economy, but they're also creating an informal economy through trading that they have that they do between their neighbours. What's quite interesting is the use of aquaculture to then culture fish through the year that then they use within the community when there's Eid celebrations, but they also sell to generate some income for for the local community. There's an educational element to this. So we can also think about the economy and improving the economy for the local communities um, as another benefit. And a lot of this is organised through Local Agenda 21. So a few of the last benefits that we can see that urban agritech can give us um, is then the improvement also of the built capital. So thinking about the built environment through greening walls, through greening rooftops, uh, we can help them improve then and uh, green the area. Um, and greening walls, we can have irrigation systems involved into that, sensors and uh, nutrients. Um, and we can go from very sort of low tech on the top of a rooftop to actually very high tech on the top of the rooftop. What we're really looking at is multi-purposing space. Uh, we can also integrate then greening um, quite intelligently then, say, for instance, fruit trees working as sustainable draining systems as well within our built capital. One of the projects that I've mentioned on this slide is how that improvement of the built capital can have the benefits for the built environment. So I've mentioned a project in the city of Ljubljana, which is in Slovenia, where they've actually, because of the improvement in the greening, the adoption of green roofs, green walls, green spaces uh, for cultivation, what they've seen is that they've seen another industry, another urban industry spin off from that, um, which they call Bee Path. So this is where the citizens um, have come together and they currently have 4,500 hives uh, creating honey and creating another income for the citizens of the city. So just to sort of finish off then about some of the other benefits um, is when we are introducing the more opportunity to use space in an innovative way, we're also encouraging social innovation within our communities. We're also giving them the opportunity to develop new businesses um, and to develop new ventures. Through activities, uh, whether they're passive or active, in engaging in horticultural practices and cultivations, 
through talking to each other. We also see other benefits within the community itself. Um, so we can see improvements in mental health, we can see improvements in health overall, um, but also through education and through more engagement and helping to bridge this rural to urban divide by bringing these agri-techs uh, bringing these agri-tech technologies from the rural area into the urban area, we might also be able to help in terms of people's choices and diets and thinking about nutrition and have wider health benefits as well. So I just want to finish off then the presentation, just highlighting a couple of different examples from around the world where technology is really, really helping urban agriculture within communities. Um, so this is an example on this slide. You can see the building with the green sides up. This is the Persona building um, in Tokyo, in Japan. Now, what is absolutely fascinating about this building is it's not just the green roof, uh, the green um, walls going up the building, but actually as you go in the building, this is an office building, but every single office, every single space is a multi-purpose space and has been turned into a farm. And it's only been possible to turn this into a farm through the use of technology. So they use temperature control, hydroponics, or automated irrigation, humidity control, supplementary lighting. Um, so this is a space where people will be working within the office, doing their day to day. But above them, you can see in that one image of a conference room, you can see that there's produce growing. They also have staff that are additionally employed to help run the farm. And all the produce and that's produced in that office environment actually goes into the staff canteen um, and also the wider uh, local community surrounding it. Um, it creates a better work environment for the employees. And one of the interesting things is when we look at Japan and we look at this example, in, in this example, often in areas like Japan, people don't necessarily own the land. They rent the building. A, a company will rent the building for, for a lease. So in this instance, what we're looking at is the complete fitting out of a building that's going to be leased maybe 60 to, to say, 80 years by the company. Um, but we can still see that this adaption of agri-tech um, within that um, building. I'm just going to finish off with a couple of more technologies uh, that are where we're seeing then technology is then urban agriculture within communities. Again, we're going to go across the world. So the first one is an app by urban farmers in the Netherlands. Now, what's really quite interesting about this app is that it helps connect the urban farmers in the area. So the urban producers with each other and also with consumers to help exchange food. They're also able to use the app to list events to chat, to debate, and also to exchange uh, cultural advice. So a knowledge exchange on how to grow things. The other app that I've mentioned on this slide, um, Farmizen, is actually in another area of the world, but, but a very innovative idea. So this is now we're in India. And in India, what they've done is developers of this app have basically got 40 uh, acres of land um, in communities around city environments. Um, and what users of the app can do is they can actually purchase, uh, not purchase, but more sort of rent and, and have shares in a 100 square foot mini farm that's in the community nearby. So they can travel out, they can grow produce, they can also use the app to sell and, and trade the produce. And when they're away from the farm, uh, that money helps to a stable income for them farm workers to just look after that produce whilst they're not on the, on the farm. Um, they are at 1,500 subscribers um, and in total 40 acres of land. So we're seeing these apps then connecting people um, and connecting then those that are producing with those that are consuming. And what I really want to sort of highlight is then what we can see with technology um, is when we're thinking about urban agriculture, often the price of land in urban environments is quite high. Um, so, and when we're growing in urban environments, the land might be contaminated. So we often need an agri-tech to help supplement urban agriculture because we're looking at non-soil production. And we may need uh, technology to help us in creating better circular economies, reusing wastewater, for instance, and um, also in helping us like these apps, in connecting them producers to consumers to help us facilitate the supply chain. And also all these technologies are going to need uh, energy sources. So we're also looking at technology and um, to help us in the integration of energy sources um, particularly renewable energy sources so there really is a role for urban agritech and urban agritech supporting urban agriculture generally so thank you very much uh, for listening and i hope that was um enjoyable and fitting in with the theme so thank you very much wendy over to you thank you so much laura i've been right around the world with you and i think that's to be um when restrictions are lifted a pathway of choice, I think, because I didn't realise it was so widespread and 
how many different innovative and types of projects there are out there. So really, really interesting. Um, I think I'll pick your brains on that a bit with a few questions after we listen to Paul. Uh, so thank you for uh, the time being, Laura. I'm going to now bring in Paul Myers from Farm Urban, who also has a project uh, called Greens for Good. So let's see if Paul's ready to tell us all about what exciting thing he's doing here in the UK for a change. Hi, Paul. Thanks you OK? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. And you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're getting on with in the UK. So I'll, I'll let you take it away, Paul, and talk about Farm Urban and Greens for Good and where you've come from, where you're going and everything about that as well. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Wendy. So... Uh, thanks for the introduction, Wendy. So I'm um, Paul Myers, and I'm one of the co-founders and um, the managing director of Farm Urban. Um, and we set up about uh, six years ago now, really, uh, with the mission of trying to grow food that's good for people in ways that are good for the planet. Um, and as Wendy and Laura both highlighted, you know, this is really needed right now um, because a lot of the food that, that's currently being produced isn't particularly good for people. You know, we've got a health and an obesity crisis. Um, and actually, a lot of the food that's been produced um, and the ways it's being produced are, are really uh, stressing the planet and, and, you know, contributing to, to the climate emergency that we're in. So I'd like to just spend the next 10 minutes really taking you through uh, our journey from uh, an idea five, six years ago um, and, and the journey we've been on as a small startup business um uh, experimenting with lots of different systems until we decided on one um that, that that we thought would work and we took a risk and, and installed our first small scale commercial farm in liverpool um so uh i'd just like to introduce jens thomas first of all so he's the co-founder of the company and uh, a very good friend so we both come from a background of, of science. Jens' his background is computer science and mine is, is, is human biology. I really both share in a passion with trying to improve human health and also trying to, trying to improve uh, the, um, the environmental health, the health of our planet. Um, so we set out trying to explore different systems in which we could do that. And the first system we came across um, was this, this idea of an integrated urban farm. So if we just take a little look, what is that? What does it mean? Um, so if we start with waste products like coffee or cardboard, um, so there's plenty of those, all the cost of coffee shops and, and Amazon packages being delivered. But if you mix those together, you can make quite a, a, an effective growth medium on which you can grow mushrooms. Now, mushrooms are incredibly good for your health and can be sold for quite high value. Once you've cropped your mushrooms, you take the leftover material along with any food waste, which is a big problem in cities, and you can feed that to worms in something called a vermiculture system. Now, worms will take these waste products and give you three very valuable outputs. They'll give you the best compost that you will ever use, a natural pesticide, and they can actually become a fish food for your aquaponic system. So aquaponics is a way of farming fish um, and a way of growing plants together. You can even do clever things like the excess oxygen from your plants and give that to your mushrooms and take the excess CO2 from your mushrooms and give that to your plants. And once your worms can't eat any more and you filleted your fish, you take that waste organic material and put that into an anaerobic digester, and that has the potential to heat and power your whole farm. So, you know, Jens and I got really excited by this concept and, and all these different integrated ideas and this kind of uh, reimagining of the food system, uh, one which was, you know, efficient and, and sustainable and interconnected not so linear and exploitative as, as the system that, that we have um, today. So we set off, um, you know, speaking to different people and drew up plans to convert abandoned spaces in, in Liverpool city centre into these fully integrated urban farms. And then we managed to persuade um, the University of Liverpool to, to give us some money to actually try and build one. And that, that's the, one of the first systems we built up on the rooftop of the university. Um, and we've got a large uh, fish tank there, which has got a few hundred koi carp in, and, and eight salad beds, um, grow beds, which are growing various salads and herbs, which we supply to the cafe directly below. 
And that was a real, uh, really great learning curve for us. You know, we begged and borrowed most of the materials there and we got a real uh, practical understanding of aquaponics and how it works. And it was great because we, you know, we were growing salads and herbs uh, without any plastic, without any uh, petrochemical fertilizers. And there was, you know, zero food miles that, that produce was being supplied to the cafe directly below. Um, so it was, it was really encouraging. But then, you know, I wasn't quite sure that actually growing food on rooftops was necessarily going to have the impact on, on um, you know, consumption habits that I really, really wanted. Um, so, so I kind of asked this question, you know, what about consumption? How, how are we going to change consumption habits and shift them towards, towards healthier uh, choices? And it was actually my, my little girl, Bella, who, who gave me this insight. So she was about two and a half at the time. And uh, I was trying to get her to eat salad and drink kale smoothies, which is a really hard sell to a two and a half year old kid, even though I'm really into this stuff. Um, and, and Bella would say, no way, daddy, I'm not eating that. I'm not drinking that. Um, and then I took one of the little aquaponic systems that we were developing at the time and I put it into our kitchen, much, much to my wife's dismay. Um, but, but Bella took an interest in, in, the, in the fish that were living in the bottom um, and, and she named them Fish and Fishy and they're still growing, growing strong today. But then she took an interest in the plants that were growing in the top of the system and she wanted to smell them and taste them. And now every morning when she gets up, uh, the first thing she does is feed those fish. We pick the leaves off the top of the aquaponic system and we put them in a blender with an apple and some honey, some water, and we blitz it up and we get this green, frothy, earthy tasting liquid. Um, and, you know, it's essentially a kale smoothie, but she absolutely loves it and drinks one. And we call them super juices. And, you know, she's in school telling all her friends about it and she's getting me to come into school with the little system and demonstrate it. And it, it was a really powerful moment for me, actually, because, it, it, you know, I witnessed behavioural change happen over the space of, of a few months. And, you know, everyone will tell you that behavioural change is really, really hard to do and takes a long time. And it does. But I think with ponics and urban farming, it's a way to hack that. And it's a way to really connect, reconnect people, especially young uh, children with food production and bringing together the, the natural organic uh, food with the, um, the, the science and the technology, the systems. It, it has real potential to, to kind of improve health and well-being and encourage you know, healthier, healthier choices. So that led us to change direction of the company slightly. And instead of having these grand plans to convert um, space, you know, rooftops into into these large scale farms. We actually started to, to to develop systems that would really engage people and, and connect, especially young people across the city. So this is another one of the early systems we developed called the Double Helix Aquaponic System. So we, we developed this with the Life Sciences College uh, in the city centre, and they designed it and, and we built it with them out of upcycled materials. And we took that to various science festivals and it now sits uh, in the reception of the building six years on and just sparks a lot of interesting conversation. Um, and, you know, the, the, the students who designed and built that were really, really bought in to, to the whole concept. And then we did a similar thing over at Botanical Gardens on the Wirral. And we took over an abandoned um, conservatory that was just overgrown. And we, we installed uh, various kind of small scale aquaponic systems and we put a vermiculture system in there um, and, and some other um, interesting urban agriculture systems and then put a lot of infographics up so that people could, could come and visit and, and, and learn about aquaponics and, and urban agriculture and the benefits of it. And so we get about 200,000 visitors there each year. Um, you know, it's just kind of spreading the word. And then we got asked by Alderhey Children's Hospital to, to install some systems on the play decks in a new hospital. This is back in 2015. Um, and the same thing that happened with, with my daughter Bella happens with the patients. And they go out and they, they sit on these systems and, and they watch the fish being fed and, and they take an interest in the leafy greens that are grown in the top. And they're asking the play specialist, you know, what is this? Can we smell it? Can we taste it? And then the outcome of that is that they're more inclined to want to try healthy food that's served to them. Um, and then we, we kind of 
further developed our small scale aquaponic system, which we call the produce pod. So this is designed to be affordable, accessible, and scalable. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's, it's built out of largely IKEA components and some everyday plumbing components. And we've open sourced the design. So wherever you are in the world, if you've got, you know, you can order IKEA parts, you can build one of these. And it's a really effective little way of, of kind of growing your own in, in your home or, or um, in your classroom. So, so we're on a, on a mission to kind of get these into homes and classrooms across the city and beyond. Um, so I've just got a little clip of you now uh, of the, the, the system kind of in action. So you can see the plants growing in the top there. Um, and it's a really, really effective way to, to engage children um, in, in this kind of future technology. And it's simple and it's affordable and it's, it's really quite accessible. Um, so then we, we kind of came into, um, into education almost by accident. So we're actually based underneath the school um, and we work with the students to develop a whole education programme. Um, and develop a lot, a, lot of, a lot of online content to allow us to kind of um, spread the word really and sh share the message and the the, um, the the skills involved in in urban agritech because um, you know I don't think this is going to be solved probably in the next ten years you know I think the the, the younger students and the generations to come are going to be the ones who are really going to going to solve this so it's it's important to us to to get that message out there early and get them involved in in the challenge. Um, so there's just uh, the aquaponic system, uh, the produce being built by a community group. So, you know, it really does work for people of, of all ages and backgrounds. It's a great way to sort of bring people together um, and, and introduce them to these concepts. So then the, the next system that we that we developed was um, we, we bought a system called the uh, the V Farm from um, Hydro Garden, which is a great uh, kind of one of the first available hydroponic systems in the UK and we built a really nice housing around it and, and tried to make it look vending machine and and the, the idea was that instead of um, you know vending machine being filled full of crisps and chocolate and sugar water it could actually be filled with living plants and we could put that in really public spaces restaurants cafes city centers and just show people that this kind of you know high-tech healthy food can be accessible and then we kind of um, came back to, to where we started, really, of, of trying to find uh, a base to, to grow food at scale and really start to feed people in, in, in Liverpool. Came across this space in, in the city centre, which, as I said before, is, is underneath a, a school in an old Victorian warehouse. Um, and and it's, you know, it's a fantastic new, but obviously it's a long way off being a, a vertical farm. So we set about raising some funds to to try and um, turn that into our, our first kind of commercial, small scale commercial vertical farm. Um, but before we did that, we had to you know choose the right technology, which is I think a big big challenge because um, there's an awful lot of technology out there. It's developing incredibly fast, um, and trying to find the right point at which to enter the market and the right technology to 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 um to go with especially for a small social enterprise uh, like us where, where you know funds you know we haven't got access to huge huge pots of cash um so luckily we're supported by the university of liverpool and we've got a, a number of phd students who work alongside us and they really helped us to decide which was the the appropriate system for us to go with um and that turned out to be the the zip farm um, which is um, a technology developed in the US and, and now distributed across Europe. So, so we raised the money and, and we installed our zip farm, our 240-tower zip farm, into the, the basement space in the Baltic Triangle in Liverpool. Um, and you can see there that, that we've got our, our 240 towers growing uh, about 3,500 leafy green and, and herb plants. And the system works really well. Um, uh, and, and we're really pleased with, with how it's turned out. And, and we actually supply our greens to the local community. Um, we sell to individuals, we sell to restaurants, and we sell to charitable organisations and some of the most vulnerable members of our community, uh, especially through through the, the, the COVID pandemic. So, you know, we're really proud to say that we've kind of, you know, got, we've got a clean, green and lean uh, food production system. 
So, so our greens are grown for taste and not transport. Um, and we actually grow living living greens. So the majority of our, of our greens are still alive when they go out the door. And they're delivered by bicycle or by electric van. Um, so they're kind of zero emissions. And the packaging that we use is totally compostable, which I'll, I'll show you um, in a minute. So we, we like this phrase, beyond organic. Um, so obviously we, we can't be certified organic because we don't go in soil. Um, but actually we're 100% pesticide free, so we can't use any pesticides on the farm. And the idea is um, one of the benefits of controlled environments, agriculture is you don't have any pests in. We're hyper-local, so all our produce is delivered within a, a four-mile radius by bike or, or electronic vehicle. And we save around 90% um, of water than if we were growing it in the traditional soil-based system. And we're, we're zero waste, so so every every um, gram of, um, of food that's, that's produced is either sold as living greens um, or turned into other products like uh, pesto or, or Liverpool lesso, which is a, a lesser version of less, uh, pesto, um, or, or composted it in a local community garden. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, we, we kind of um, umbrella, put that in, under the um, umbrella brand of Greens for Good. Um, so we're not just a, you know, a vertical farm in, in a warehouse uh, in a peri-urban space. We're, we're really in the heart of our community. Um, and we're supporting a, a lot of uh, really vulnerable members of our community and trying to educate the, the, the young young members of our community on the importance of, of this kind of technology and, and the, con the, con the contribution that it makes to, towards um, you know, fighting the climate crisis. Um, so, so as I mentioned before, our, our greens we sell are alive. So you can see there, we, this little, little lettuce has still got its roots on. And there should be a, a little video now just demonstrating actually how we harvest them and, and package them. So you can see that the lettuce is pulled out of the tower, still got the roots on, um, and it goes into a little cardboard cup with some water in the bottom. And then that's popped into the box, the cardboard box, um, packaged up and, and sent off on its way. So when the customer gets them, they open the box and um, they take the greens out and they can put them on the windowsill or, or just open the, the lid of the box. And those greens will last, you know, one, two, three weeks. The, the, the record we've got is actually three months because Jens's mum, he sent her a box for Christmas in the post. She lives down south. And then in March, he went down to visit and the greens were, were still there on the windowsill. And he had to explain to her that she was supposed to eat them over the course of a week. I think she thought they were more of a house plant, but it just so it shows that, you know, they, they really uh, do have a, a very long shelf life. And with that comes ma maximum nutrient density. So, you know, once once a plant is harvested, its nutrients start to drop off um, around 10% a, a day. Um, so we really, you know, maintain the, the nutrient density of our produce. Um, so, so just some kind of some more images of, of the the the, the, the tins in, in full production and the boxes um, as they to go out the door. Um, and these are our donation boxes, so they're slightly smaller, and they contain three three living lettuce plants, um, and and they go out to the the community organisations we've been working with. So we've been working with homeless shelters, um, we've been working with families kind of pushed into crisis uh, through COVID. Um, uh, charities supporting uh, people with um, disabilities and a lot of asylum uh, asylum seekers and mig the migrant community and they've been really the feedback we've had has been fantastic you know they talk about the the kind of the dignity that they have by by receiving this really fresh high value product and um, you know it's not your standard food package which you might get from a from a food bank a pot noodle or, or, or some some rice it's actually really healthy, high quality produce. So just some images of, of kind of the, the, the people that we've been supporting uh, through COVID. Um, so some families, some elderly people um, be, being getting in our boxes. And up at the top left there, you can see our delivery partners. So that's Agile, who are a fantastic social enterprise uh, who take our boxes out on their, their e-powered uh, freight bikes and, and distribute them to, to people within a, within a four mile radius. Um, so some more people benefiting from, from greens over the summer and um, uh, our little uh, Lesto, which is our uh, lettuce-based 
pesto that we've got there that, that's been quite fun. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, one of the real opportunities is, um, is getting these systems into public spaces um, and, you know, trying to find value added. Uh, and this is a system that we put into um, an office building, uh, Bruntwood Works in Liverpool, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, it's a way to really brighten the space and just, you know, something different. You know, people, you know, hundreds of people are walking past that every day and they can actually take the plants out, box them up and take them up to the office or take them home with them. And I think it's these, you know, creative, innovative um, ways of, get, of getting this technology into communities that, that is really we want to, where we want to focus a lot more of our, of our efforts now. Um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a brilliant wallpaper. It's much better than concrete. So I have these living plants all over the place. And, uh, you know, they, they really do, do look nice. So, you know, our vision is to kind of find a way to, to feed the future that, that is, you know, sustainable. And, and, and again, coming back to that good for people and good for the planet. So, so I hope that you've, um, you've, you know, gained some kind of insights into the journey that we've been on over the last five years, the systems that we tried and the one we settled on. Um, and some of the activities that, that we're embarking on at the moment. And um, so I'd really look forward to any questions and, and chatting about it further. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was amazing. I love the idea of open source from IKEA. So anybody anywhere can do that. But it's amazing the journey you've been on. And I say I've only known you, what, I think about 12, 18 months. And from where you were then to where you are now, as they really really well done um much to be proud of i think from yourselves so i think okay. probably now is the best time to bring laura back in as i have had some questions uh, sent sent through that i'd like to ask you both and get your opinions on so welcome back laura i uh, hope you enjoyed that talk too i've i've literally been loving this i love every time one of these events because i learn so much more and i say whether it's going to be liverpool or I'm going to be to Slovenia. It's really, really exciting what's going on in the urban agri-tech space. So one of the questions I've been asked, and it, it's probably for, for both of you, so I'll probably come to yourself first, Laura, is do you see a greater need for the uptake of urban agri-tech within the most highly populated areas within the UK? I, I do, I do, Wendy. I really do see that there's a, a greater need for it. Um, I think the, the benefits we get from urban agri-tech um, are very much needed by right now. Um, and what I'm really grateful for, for having Paul um, on as well, is some of the stuff that he was talking about, the affordability of it. So I think we need urban agri-tech, but we also need urban agri-tech and we need food production. We need to multi-base. We need to shorten that supply chain. We need to induce behavioural change as well. Um, and that is something that's a benefit of urban agri-tech. Um, we also need to, to build better co community cohesion and we need more resilient supply chains desperately. Um, we need to have these supply chains then that are able to cope with things like pandemics and having food production locally, having technology aid you in that food production is important aspect to that, but it also needs to be affordable. And it needs to be affordable so that we're not creating more food poverty. Um, mm. So that's why I think it's great that we've had Paul on the on the call and um, presenting some of the stuff that they've done. Because uh, that for me is, is is really what we need. We need that type of urban agri-tech. Yeah. And so, Paul, what do you think are the misconceptions around implementing urban agri-tech in the community? Um, I, th I think... You know, one of the largest misconceptions is that this has to be, you know, you need tens, tens of millions of pounds to do it. Otherwise, you can't make it work. Um, you know, I think the thing that speaks to me most is that people people buy food in lots of different ways, you know, right fr from people who shop in farmer's markets, people who shop in, you know, budget supermarkets and people who shop in, you know, really, really high end stores. And for me, urban agriculture can kind of replicate that. And, and you know, you can have something available for people at every level. Um, and, you know, for us, we kind of adapt the environment that we were in. Um, we, you know, we're a social enterprise. We've got a strong community network. We don't have to, to huge pots of, of funding, but we find a way to make it work. And that really is through that community supported 
um, agricultural model, but actually not through the share um, model, which I was really interested to see. Uh, I think that's definitely something that I'm going to explore because I think our members in our community, you know, would back that. Um, so yeah, misconceptions, you don't need huge amounts of money to do it. Um, I think you just need to be creative and resilient and um, find a way to make it work, is what I would say. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and COVID-19 has really brought, as you say, that greater awareness of the food supply chain resilience and traceability and that sourcing of our food. So I mm. think probably I'll ask both of you, and I'll, I'll start with yourself, Laura. How do you see all of this now helping, hindering, the use of CEA and urban ta urban agritech going forward and longer term? So I, I don't really see a, a hindrance. Um, I suppose what I see is I see some challenges that we need to overcome. Um, but I, I really do see that the direction that urban agritech is, is going is really positive. Um, so I see more of urban agritech that the industry's been building um, over the last couple of years, engagement with it, awareness of it. Um, so really, the, I think I suppose the, the challenges uh, for me is, is that we actually need probably just more outreach, more education, and more knowledge exchange. And when I say knowledge exchange, I also mean between urban and rural as well. Um, so um, one of the one of the things where I sit is is I do work with, with rural and in, in rural plant biology and, and rural horticulture production and urban. Um, you know, the plants plants themselves fundamentally the biology of them they're not really going to change what we're doing is we're thinking about the environment we're thinking of cultivation we're thinking of practices we're thinking of safe food traceable food nutritious food um so some of these uh, lessons and some of these ideas and the implications and, and implementations and the protocols with heck you know we need to have the, the role in the urban and uh, connection even greater that's something that we should uh, as a challenge go forward with addressing um, because there's lots of things to be learned at both sides. New social chains, uh, new ways of doing things, new social innovations that can come from the urban sphere, new ways of thinking outside the box. Uh, there's a lot of experience with how we can grow coming from the rural side, how we can implement technologies um, and understandings of lessons learned from, from the past, uh, what the current supply chains are. Um, and really it's getting that cross talk. We do also need outreach. Um, I think one of the other challenges is actually in policy. And I think Paul actually touched on it when he said, we're not certified organic. This is that we've heard across the world, that we're not certified as organic. We've got an opportunity with Urban Agritech to have these amazing circular economies that reuse city waste at the point that the waste is produced that can really be innovative. Um, we need to somehow have a recognition system for that, a certification system for that, that consumers then, that can then recognize and also be aware of um, and get involved in. Um, so we've got challenges, but ultimately I do see that it's gonna continue to, to, to grow. Um, how we can help that quicker is by engaging policymakers, um, making investors aware, of this to help those to have models to help those who want to go into it and as Paul said you don't always have all singing all dancing really expensive kit you can make it work with with, with technologies that are available that are a bit cheaper mm. um, but it's having that knowledge and, and being able to access that knowledge um, and learn these things as well so there's the education side of it. Yeah I think for yourself then Paul what what's probably been the most important lesson you've learned on this journey and the flip side of that What's been your highlight? What's been the best moment on the journey so far? Oh, that's been a big question. Um, there's been many, many daily challenges, daily challenges. I, I think I just, it's like, a, it's a grind. You know, it's, I think it's the perseverance because um, you, it's just finding solutions to, to problem after problem after problem is how you get to the, 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 the right solution. So I wouldn't say there's been one major challenge actually um i'd say there's been lots of little ones so access to finance the right technology the the right people um, the right space affordable space so i think it's it's lots and lots of in, you know small challenges that make this sector you know really hard to hard to do but as is the case with any new emerging technology i think um so what was the what was the second highlight? Um, yeah, I think 
launching launching greens for good to be honest because that that really did feel like it was kind of you know we've often been criticized and said well are you an r&d company are you an education company do you grow food you know what do you do and and we've really held on to the fact that we do all three because though each each of those reinforce each other and as laura said the education piece is so important to almost farm your customers of the future um and, and greens for good has really been able to bring those three things together into what is a coherent concept that and more like a means that the whole city is kind of getting behind um so i'd say that that's definitely been a highlight and you, you know seeing those is which i'm just super proud of the quality of the product that's going out the door Amazing. I think you're right there, Laura. And hopefully today for the people listening in has been that knowledge exchange, that uh, raising that awareness, that education piece across everybody. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, your background or anything like that. Understanding what is available and you guys have been absolutely fantastic. I really can't thank you enough. So as we said, this was our second session all around urban agritech on your doorstep. I think we can see now it can be on anybody's doorstep. Uh, What's a edible wall in your lounge or in your office, uh, on the rooftop, underground, absolutely amazing, and in any country or setting. Um, as I've said, this is really, really important for us. This is you know one of the sessions we deliver. If you do want to get in touch with either Paul or Laura, please do feel to reach out to them. But if you want to direct any questions to ourselves and our Agritech um, programme, Email agritecheaglelabs at barclays.com and we'll be happy to put you in touch with these guys or, again, talk you through what we're doing as well because we are all in this together. Um, as we said, there's no um, one grail, if you like, to overcome the challenges within the agricultural sector and that food supply chain. So, again, once again, thank you very much, Laura. I've really enjoyed it and thank you, Paul. I've learned so much yet again. And I look forward to catching up with you soon in the very near future. Brilliant. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, you know. thanks Paul. Thanks for having us, Wendy. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Not a problem. We love it.